Holy Spirit. Amen. We have our Lord telling us today about the cross, that He has come to save the world, and He gives commandments that we are to follow, which really are quite easy, but we complicate them terribly. But as easy as they are, they cost a great deal. As I've said many times, and I say to the catechumens, when you desire to unite yourself to Christ in the Orthodox Church, it will cost you everything. It costs you your entire life. Because Christ does not just demand little bits of us or little compartments from our lives. He asks for everything. When the Lord tells us when the man comes tempting him, which Lord is the greatest commandment? He tells it, you know, that here is the Lord thy God is one God, as he says in the other ones. To love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, with all thy mind. That means everything. That's everything we have. We don't have anything more to offer than our soul and our mind and our heart. We don't have anything more than that. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we love ourselves properly, not some egotistical kind of way, that is everything. With everything that we have. Now keep in mind, these people had just previously tried once again with not simplicity of heart, but with great guile to tempt the Lord. First, by asking him if he were to pay taxes to Caesar or not, right before this passage. He wisely answers this, to render unto Caesar what was Caesar's, and to God what was God's. And then they came up with this absurd hypothetical situation of the woman who has seven husbands that die, and whose husband, or whose wife should be in the resurrection. A really absurd situation that really would not have happened. The way it would have happened. But yet, that's the way these people's minds were working, and he answered them wisely there as well. But we are to love God with everything. As St. Paul tells us, whether we eat or we drink, or whatever we do, we are to do it to the glory of God. It is not with just a little bit of our lives. And we can do some things that are noble, that really aren't noble, because we aren't doing them to the glory of God. When I was reading this passage last Sunday evening, when I left here, like a normal pattern, I started thinking, what was I going to say about this one? The first thing that came to mind, which is usually the best idea I'll have all week, was of the story from everyday saints with Skiba Monk Melchizedek. You may remember this monk, a very ancient monk of the Pskov Caves, who, of course, some of us could have known. He was ancient because of his age, not because of antiquity. Skiba Monk Melchizedek was known, it was Father Michael at the time, as a wonderful worker. He was a great laborer who was good at handcraft and work, woodwork. So the monastery was filled with works that he had done, whether it was analogia or icon frames or chests of drawers or chairs. He was quite good at this, and he was so good at it that it really became the focal point of his life. He would work endless hours. He worked so hard that the story goes that eventually he died, dropped on the spot. He wasn't a very old man. He had labored that hard. Of course, all the monks are horrified when they find him this way. And Elder John Christian King, who at least one person in this church knew, came to him and they said, he's not dead. And he eventually he, he rises up when they pray over him. Father Michael immediately asks for the great schema from the abbot. The abbot thinks he's crazy, but the next day, if you've read this book, you'll know the abbot was a very temperamental man, said immediately, we're tonsuring him. He had a reason for tonsuring him. So the writer of this book, the author of this book, Father Tikhon, says that many years later when he was a novice and he was, they took turns reading the Psalter and the prayers in the church every day. One night he always followed Stephen Monk Melchizedek in his turn and for quite a long time he had never shared one word, just the bow and that's it. Because Stephen Monk Melchizedek took this seriousness of the great schema with all his heart and did not speak unless absolutely necessary. But one night he said in his, I guess, audacity, the young novice Tikhon at the time, he said, what did you see when you died? It's a question everyone had always wanted to ask him, but no one had quite the audacity or boldness to do so. 
and he didn't know what kind of answer he was going to get back. Well, the Melchizedek remained silent for a while, which is increased by the Tikkun's fear, I'm sure. And eventually he said he had this vision where he was in this green, grassy plain, and ahead of him he saw this river that was filled with mud and clumps of earth. And as he looked more carefully, he saw analogians and chest of drawers and chairs all piled up on one another. All that he had built, he recognized the work. And he sees beside him a woman standing who he instantly recognizes to be the mother of God. She looks somewhat somber. and She says to him, you're a monk. The only thing we wanted from you was one thing, one main thing, prayer and repentance. Instead, you gave us woodwork. With that, he woke up from the dead. He realized that the woodwork wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It's actually quite a good thing. We're done to the glory of God. But the woodwork had taken over the main purpose in his life, in the monastery, prayer and repentance. I know a monk that's fairly close to me in Arizona one time told me that he went to the abbey with this other great project he had. He's the project guy at the monastery. He had another great project that he wanted done instantly. And the abbot there looked at him and said, we need time for prayer. We need to dignify that part of it. Not that the work was bad, but he could see that something was getting in the way. Imam Melchizedek was called to love the Lord his God with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his heart. And that was what was demanded of him. There's a story in, of St. John Moschus in the 6th century of an Abba Christopher that he ran into in one of the monasteries, I believe, of Palestine. And he goes to him and asks him his story. It's at the end of his life. And his story was this. Every day when he was a young monk, and he did this for 10 years, he would go down to where the fathers were buried in the cave and pray. Now, as each step on the way down, he would do 100 prostrations and pray. There were 18 steps, so he did at least 1,800 prostrations a day. He would wait there until he heard the call for church and then go up. He did this every day for 10 years. So one day he goes down there and he sees all these candles lit around the floor, most of them lit, not all of them. And there are these two angels there. And he asks them, what have they done to the floor? Because that's where he would do his prayer. He said, these are the candles lit of those who have, of course, set the kingdom of God. What about mine? Is it lit? They say to him, pray, and we will light it for you. Of course, Father Christopher, being much like one of us, said, pray. What is it that you think I've been doing till now? With that, the vision departed. He took it to mean that he still had to offer more, more to God. What he was offering was not enough for his soul. So he went to Sinai and lived there for 50 years in even greater austerity. At the end of those 50 years, he returned and very shortly, having gained great grace, departed with his fathers to the kingdom of heaven. His stories, yes, they're austere, they're strict, they're monastic, but they're the same commandments that we are called to, to love the Lord our God with all that we have, every single thing, not to hold back one moment of our life. We have time for other things, we have time for God. When we're doing other things, we have time for God. I find housework, yard work quite beneficial to prayer. Add prayer to it, there will be much more grace. Food is better cooked with prayer than it is when just slapping it together. Our jobs are much better and more peaceful when at least occasionally we will add a Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and mercy and be a sinner in the middle of it. When we love our neighbor even more, the more we love God. The image comes to mind of St. Dorotheus of Gaza when he describes God as a circle, as a center. These radii going out from it. 
the farther we're away from God, and we are put spots on those rays going from it, the farther we are from our neighbor. The closer we get to God, the closer we are to our neighbor by virtue of drawing in closer on those rays. So loving our neighbor comes in easily when we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength, as the other passages said. With everything that we have. If there's anything that you are holding back in your lives, any little thing, give it to God from this moment, today. If there's any detail of life that is standing in the way of true piety and falling in love deeply with God, do it today. I often hear people say, well, I didn't pray last night, Father. Well, I dropped away from prayer. But the reality is we wouldn't do that with someone we were falling in love with whatsoever. We give everything to them, and we spend great amounts of time trying to win them over and doing surprising things for them and talking to them and talking to them and talking to them to get to know them. Try to get to know God. Try to get to know His most pure mother. Try to get to know the saints. Spend great amounts of time in conversation with them, and you will find that the more you do this, the more deeply you fall in love with the one thing needful. That is taking up our cross. That is loving God with everything that we have. Every single thing that we have. Give it to God. Amen.